Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. I'm your host, Brad Barrett. And today on the show, we have a really special guest, a returning guest. So this is Deanna, who you may remember if you're a longtime listener from episode 106, which was titled From Addiction to Fi. And Deanna's story is truly remarkable. It is the episode that I send people to if you're getting a late start on Fi or no matter what your background is, no matter what you've been through, you can still make positive change to make your life better and make it extraordinarily better. And I think that is the perfect way to look at the power of Fi. And I think Deanna's story exemplifies that in the best way possible. So I'm really excited to welcome her back. Welcome to Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hi, Deanna, my friend. It is so good to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Awesome to see you, Brad. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, this should be great. So as I said in the intro, your story is amazing, truly amazing. And for anybody who hasn't heard that episode, so naturally, it was over four years ago at this point, which is hard to believe it's been that long. And I would highly recommend, and I don't do this very often, just hit pause on this episode go back and download episode 106 of Choose of I and listen to that episode. You will not regret it for one second. It is truly out of 600 episodes, one of the most remarkable episodes ever. It might be the single one. That's not hyperbole. And I don't say that lightly. So Deanna, I do want to kind of rehash a little bit. If you could just give like just a quick summary for those people who didn't just listen to my, uh, my plea to go back and listen to it. Where have you been? over the last 10 years and just kind of catch us up. And then I think this is going to be a launching point for truly the power of Phi in every possible way. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll try to do it in a quick few minutes. So yeah, I... that, it, it's a big <laughs> ask. I, I know. So <laughs> that's all right. Elevator speech, right? So, you know, I'm 50 years old. I actually just turned 50 this past week. Wow. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Crazy. I'm excited. It was tough for me at first, but I think I'm embracing it now, right? It, nice. It's good. So, literally just a number, right? That's what everybody keeps saying. And I feel good. So, that's what matters. I hope I get another 50. So, my story, you know, is that I have a past that I struggled with drug addiction and alcoholism. And off and on throughout my adult life, I, I was a pretty high functioning addict and alcoholic. I always worked and took care of myself as much as possible. But I had a lot of woundedness that I was not dealing with. And in my case, it just manifested in addictive behavior. And so it kind of came to a head when I was in my mid-30s and I hit a pretty hard bottom. So I had gotten into some harder drugs and was in a tumultuous, abusive relationship and I just in a very low, low, low point. And by the grace of God, I hit a bottom that caused me to want to seek help. And I did just that. And so I got into the rooms of recovery in 2010 and started this journey of really wanting to uncover how did I end up here? You know, I didn't want to just get sober. I wanted to really figure out the why. And, you know, I did all of that. And so about four years into the journey, and I'm still doing that. I think it's a lifelong journey. But anyway, about four years into my recovery, I wanted to start working on my finances. So I had kind of been just treading water when I got sober, keeping things afloat. And I met a woman who got me on a budget and taught me the Dave Ramsey plan. And so I started embracing that and paying off my debt using the snowball method and did that for about, I think it took me about three and a half years, if I recall. And near the end of my debt payoff, your podcast was starting to take off and a friend introduced me to it. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> like, <laughs> what is this? This might be the next step. I had always been intimidated by investing. And you know, when I started listening to you guys and I read The Simple Path to Wealth, it became incredibly 
practical. I realized I could do this. Like it's not rocket science. It did require a little bit of reading and researching, but it's not as hard as I thought it was. And I was no longer intimidated because I think I was now becoming to the point where I was above the line and I could actually start thinking about putting money away into investing. Prior to that, it wasn't even a reality. So I didn't try to understand it. So I paid off all my debt in, let's see, the end of 2017. So it was just around, I think, forty six, forty seven thousand dollars $47,000 I paid off. And yeah, dove head first into investing. And, you know, I had been living on a, a small percentage of my income while I was paying off the debt. So I kind of did the same thing in the new year, 2018, when I started investing. And that began my journey to where I am today. So that's kind of a, is that a good recap? That's an amazing recap. Wow. So, right. And we spoke with you, the episode was published in December of 2018, right? So at that yeah. point, you incredibly, yeah, you had found Chooseify in early 2017 from a, a recommendation from a friend of yours who I actually spoke with recently, which was kind of cool. Oh, you did? Yeah, just randomly. So that was, that was neat. Wow. And yeah, Deanna, you said a bunch of things in there that, that I did want to touch on because I went back and listened to your, your prior episode, 106, and two of the things that really jumped out to me were actually about Dave Ramsey and then budgeting. So you said at the time, you felt like there was no way out financially. It would be so hard to dig out from this debt, from not knowing what to do. And, and you said that Dave Ramsey was a great mentor to me. And he speaks to the person who is down and out. And I just thought that was beautiful because, you know, a lot of people think that Dave Ramsey and the Phi movement are at odds. And I just like to say on record as many times as possible, I don't think that's true at all. Certainly not from my perspective. I think, as you said, he does speak to the person who is down and out. And the seven baby steps are just so crystal clear. And the debt snowball, there's just great beauty in that simplicity. And I think to me, obviously, some of the things he says, I don't love the anti-credit card that are, is so dogmatic, but at least I understand it from a perspective because again, he's speaking to a certain person who needs help and he's helped tens of millions of people. And I think once you get maybe to that sixth or seventh step, then possibly you look for more. And that's, that really is what you did. You found the yeah. simple path to wealth. You found choose a fi and it was a launching pad. Yeah, Exactly. I mean, when I first started listening to him, and it's the coworker that introduced me to financial independence that uh, started bringing in, um, I don't remember, it might've been on DVD, his course, Dave Ramsey's course, and we would listen. And it was radical to me when he just said, you don't have to, like people keep their student loan debt around for years, like it's a pet. And he said, you don't have to do that. You can get very intense and very intentional and pay it off. And it was the first time anybody had ever said that to me. I just thought, oh, I'm going to have this debt for the next 30 years of my life. And it was almost like he gave me the freedom to think differently about it. Yeah. And then getting on a budget. So my friend that sat me down, who was so gracious to help me get on a budget, I gave her all the numbers. She popped it in to an Excel budget. And when I realized there was a little extra margin to actually start attacking the debt where I hadn't seen because I hadn't been budgeting. You know, if you don't pay attention to your money, it just kind of flies out the window, which was the case for me. I mean, I was paying my debt or my bills, but I was not paying attention to the extra margin that I had. So that became freedom, just having a budget and sticking to it and then applying all the extra towards the debt so I could actually get somewhere. Yeah. And that was the quote you said in the other episode, which was, you said it was freeing. Exactly. And you said you found a great amount of freedom being able to tell my money where to go. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it's interesting because I think for me, and I understand this is coming from a place of like, I'm just kind of lucky that I was born this way. I think that like budgeting never made sense. Like I, I didn't need it, I guess. And this is through no fault or, or benefit of my own. It's just, again, how I was wired. So I'm not taking any credit for this. But like, I always just kind of, okay, I'm spending less than I earn. And then I have this leftover money. And then it's just, okay, where do I put it? But I think, as you know, certainly from your own your own life, and Jonathan, our longtime co-host here at Chooseify, he needed to budget. It was the exact same thing. And I think it's interesting seeing the people that, and, and I've grown a great appreciation for budgeting. This is also something like, it, while I knew nothing about Dave Ramsey when I started Chooseify, 
budgeting was a foreign concept to me, but I'd love for you to just go into it a little bit further, if you don't mind, because I think there are a lot of people out there who could benefit from a budget, but might think that it's overly restrictive, whereas you're using this perfect word of freedom. It reminds me of like the Jocko Willing, discipline equals freedom. So speak to that person who doesn't understand, like, why should I budget when it just feels horrible to me? It feels like this diet or restriction. Yeah. So we still budget somewhat, but I think because of the years of intentionality, we've been able to ease off of the budget a little bit, but we just put, anyway, I don't have to go into that just yet. <laughs> no. And that's, well, that's the nice thing. And, and we will, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we will talk about who the we is first sure. off, because that's uh, we're kind of burying the lead here. So, <laughs> so that's a, a big part of your story, obviously, but there's nothing wrong with making adjustments in any aspect of your life or FI yeah. or what you need, right? Because maybe at this season of your life, when you were first learning about this, when you were $47,000 in debt, budgeting was essential because it gave you that structure for, hey, I need to wrap my arms around this and this budget helps me concretely. Yeah. And maybe now that's not quite as necessary. Well put, Brad. That's exactly correct. Yeah. So, you know, I had all these minimum payments that I had to make. I had, when I was in debt, credit card debt, student loan debt. I think I still had a car payment. And I ended up moving in with my parents partway when I was paying off the debt, actually near the end so that I could really intensify it. So that gave me a, a bigger shovel. But the budget, it allowed me to decide how much money I needed each month for gas, for groceries, for just spending. And I did a cash budget. So I would take the cash out and I used the envelope system and I labeled them all. So I knew if I was down to my last 20 bucks on groceries for the month, I could borrow from another envelope, but it helped me really stay intentional about knowing how much I had to space out for the whole month. So that's how I did it. And then I you know, made all my minimum payments to my debt. And then when I had extra, I just literally applied it to the debt that I was attacking. So as Dave Ramsey prescribes, you pay off the smallest debt first, regardless of interest, so that you get a psychological win and you feel the momentum. And then once you pay that debt off, you snowball that payment into the next debt and so on. So by the time you get to your largest debt, your, your snowball is rather big and you can make some serious progress. So yeah, the budget, I, I really did feel a sense of freedom because I knew, and if I needed to add something to the budget, I would, and I would just have to rework the numbers, but it gave me freedom to know, okay, I've got this much money for entertainment. It's not like total deprivation. It's really about knowing what you have to spend on each category. And if you need to borrow from one or the other, you can do that. And then making sure you're making progress with, you know, in my case, with the debt. Right. And then when you did pay off that debt, so you paid off, you said almost $47,000 worth of, of these various debts yeah. and through that debt snowball method. But then you come to the end of that and now, okay, you have this structure, you have extra margin every month. What did that look like after you paid off that debt? Yeah. So immediately, amazingly, I paid off the debt at the end of one year. So I got to start out 2018, maxing out all my retirement accounts. So I just quickly set up all those things to be maxed out. So I, at the time I had access to a simple IRA and set that up to be maxed out through my payroll. I started maxing out a Roth IRA. And that way I wasn't seeing this huge chunk of my paycheck. Now I did move out of my parents' house. And so I had to allow you know money for rent and so forth. But I was able to max all those things out. And because I had learned to live on less, transitioning to the investment phase, I was comfortable. I mean, I had to live on a little bit more, obviously, when I moved out of my parents' house, but I was very comfortable maxing out all my retirement accounts. It wasn't like this shock to the system where you know I had learned to do that when I was paying off the debt. And then just saving for things that I know are going to happen, like car repairs and just putting money aside every month to do that felt amazing. It's almost like you don't need an emergency fund when you save for things that you know are going to happen, like Christmas. Like, right? It comes every year, <laughs> same time, just start saving. Yeah, Deanna, that is so powerful. And it's interesting because we had uh, Karsten Bigern from uh, Early Retirement Now on, on an episode a, a bunch of years back. And he challenged for us basically, do you need an emergency fund? And I think this really triggered a lot of people like not, you know, I'm saying that in a, in a joking way, not in a, in a terrible way, but because an emergency fund is so sacrosanct when it comes to personal finance, it is the one thing that you can't touch. But I think Carson did a really good job with it and it made me rethink. And 
for anybody hearing this instantly getting kind of a little bit triggered is this is not saying don't have money saved. This is not saying don't have net worth, don't have, I mean, you could have millions of dollars of assets and technically not have a quote unquote emergency fund in the traditional sense, which most people think of it. And, and that might actually be the biggest issue is just how we think of this emergency fund as something that is sitting there idle, doing nothing, essentially forever, and just waiting for some emergency that may or may not ever come. And Carson's point was, what type of emergency would that actually be, where you essentially had to pay cash instantly, or use a check where you couldn't use credit card, or I mean, it's hard to think of something that's over your daily ATM limit, let's say, right? And this is not saying have zero dollars in your checking account. Clearly not the case. In fact, I keep a big buffer in my checking account just for stress mitigation purposes of, I don't want to worry about, oh, there's a credit card bill coming out. Do I have to move money around? So for me in the the hierarchy, it's stress mitigation. And then again, with this emergency fund, if it was something massive, you could put it on a credit card and then just sell some assets, let's say, sell some mutual funds and then pay off that credit card if it was something extraordinary. But again, what would that be? Like a new roof on a house would be, I don't know, 10, 15,000, whatever it may be, five, 10, $15,000, I, I guess. But as you said, and that's why I'm going off on this tangent is it's more like the, the quote that we use is life is lumpy, which is your life doesn't cost the same every month. Yeah. It's not like saying, hey, my life costs $36,000 a year, so therefore it's 3000 every single month. It doesn't work though, because there are the holidays in December where almost invariably your costs are going to go up. There's a trip that you might take in pick a month. I don't care what it is, April. And that'll be a couple thousand dollars or whatever it may be. Life is lumpy. That's not an emergency. And I think that key that you, you hit on so profoundly it's really important for us to understand that. And like, doesn't it feel amazing to not have to think that that's an emergency? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, years ago when I was, you know, in debt and just living below the line, if I had a flat tire, that would be an emergency. And just this other, maybe three weeks ago, I had to get four new tires. I had damage and there was an issue with my tires. And so I bought four new tires and it was like, oh, just take it out of the car fund. No problem. It just felt, it's such a different yeah, way of life. Yeah. So talk me through the car fund. I know you said that a couple of minutes ago and I kind of glossed over it, but since you just reiterated. So now that you're in a different financial position, again, this much more stable financial position, and we'll, and we'll go into that, but you have these, I think people call them like sinking funds or something. Uh, that might be the wrong terminology, but is that how you, you actually have a fund for either car payments, car repairs, future car? Is that how you think about it? Yeah. And I keep them in buckets. It helped me. I started doing this when I was paying off my debt and we still do it today. So we have a savings account with Ally when the interest is pretty decent right now, that fluctuates, but I have different buckets. So one for a car, which I kind of lump car maintenance, future car, license, renewals, all that into one. And I put money every month into that. And then I have a bunch of different ones, vacation or skiing. And so just money goes out of checking into those funds every month and it just kind of sits there. And then if we need to use it, transfer it into checking, or usually we put it on a credit card so we get some points and then transfer it into checking and pay it off. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Okay. So as part of your monthly, let's say the two of you earn X number of dollars per month and it, you are putting a certain amount in each of these other funds. I, I don't know if there are other ones other than car. I assume there are, but yeah. talk me through that because I think this is going to be really helpful for many people out there who are looking for a system, because like you said, it's so easy to get intimidated by personal finance and everyone hits on a different system that works for them. And while your system might not work for me perfectly, it's going to work amazingly well for some people. So if you don't mind that I'm really diving into just the details of this, I, I think it will be very helpful. Yeah, no problem. I was trying to log into my account so I can tell you exactly how many I have. But yeah, so we get, you know, so much money coming in every month. And we've just set up automatic transfers in addition to like investing, but automatic transfers to these different savings accounts that we have or different buckets at, at Ally. So there's one for automotive, there's one for vacation and skiing. There is an emergency fund. There's a future home, future car, 
his children. Then we've set up some for my niece and nephew. So we just, these set amounts come out of our checking account every month and move over to these savings accounts and they grow unless we need them. And then we take out what we need and then they just continue to grow. So yeah, setting them up automatically and kind of thinking about it ahead of time, like how much should we set aside every month? How much can we afford to set aside each month for these different funds? And what are our goals? And so I love that. It just helps me. And to be honest with you, outside of, I mean, we don't own our own home right now. So once we do, I'm sure we'll have like a home repair fund. But outside of that, there's not too many other emergencies, you know, other than the world ending or the st- you know, like right. the uh, zombie apocalypse, as I like to call right. it, which we cannot exactly plan for. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. The, the ultimate black swan event. Yeah, I, I hear you. It's you have to be rational. Yeah. Oh, and then we just recently opened up savings accounts for my two nephews and my niece. So every Christmas and birthday, I give them money and it has the interest rates were going up. I'm like, I should just be putting this into a savings account. So we're doing that, you know, and now I have that in my bucket and, you know, it's fun to be saving for other people too. Yeah, I like that. So right in this Ally Bank account, you're able to create essentially as many of these sub accounts as you want. Yeah. And I set it up so that my nephews and my nieces, you know, they're the custodians, you know, it's, I forget how I set it up, but I called Ally before I did it so that, you know, they're listed as a custodian. And once they turn 18, they would get the money. Um, Okay. Yeah. So those actually are their accounts, but Mm -hmm. it's, you can access it through your login and therefore you can send the money there. Yep. That's beautiful. No, just out of curiosity, something like a, a car fund, for instance. Yeah, you know, cars, as we well know, are very expensive and, and need a lot of repairs. But hypothetically, let's say you plan on holding your existing car for 10 or 15 years and you're putting in monthly amounts and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Do you eventually get to a point where you might consider pulling back on adding money to that? Or is it am I kind of just splitting hairs here? I don't foresee that with us just yet because as I'll maybe get into later, we do have one car payment, but in reality, yeah, if we have no car payments and we're just putting into this and if it got so big, absolutely, I would see a point for cutting back. Cool. So yeah, good problem to have, obviously, but I (laughs) I, I guess I'm just trying to think through like clearly something like your travel fund would be something that theoretically, I'm assuming is going to get, if not mostly emptied each year, then fairly close because that's that's an annual thing and while like you said you're you're earning travel rewards points which are great and i'm sure minimize that but whereas something like a car theoretically if you don't replace it if if you just get lucky or you get a a nice reliable honda or toyota or something and, and you don't need a lot of repairs over a 10 or 15 year period it could be a different scenario so again i'm just thinking for that person listening to this wondering oh how might deanna do that basically so okay yeah so, Deanna, I, I think that's a great overview of your system. And, and, and I love that because, again, it's this discipline equals freedom, right? You set up this structure that works. And it, it took some time to set it up at the beginning, but now it's just on autopilot. Yeah. And I think that it's just a really freeing thing mentally when your money is just working for you. It's just getting zipped off into all these different places, I'm sure, into retirement accounts and taxable brokerage for you. And then all of these various uh, ally accounts. And I'm sure there are even more that, I, that I'm not listing here. But having that structure, I think, is, is really important. So that is a background. We, we have alluded a couple of times now to uh, some big things going on in your life. I, we've used the word we a number of times. So let's catch everybody up on, on where you've been. So again, it was four years ago and a couple months, so about a little over 50 months ago that we uh, published the episode with you. Let's do another little fast forward on what's been going on. Yeah. So I got married and met my husband in the hardest year to meet people, which was 2020, which is miraculous in and of itself anyway. Wow. So I think the bigger miracle is if people had listened to my story or know my story or even just start to hear it as I talk, I had some woundedness in relation with my father growing up. And amazingly, that has been reconciled. But I've done a lot of work on that. But not surprising that it affected my relationship with men. And I just was always finding myself in unhealthy relationships. So when I got sober, I was single for a long period of time. A, because I wanted to work on it, and B, I didn't want to continue to repeat the same cycles. Um, But then it just kept prolonging, you know, it just wasn't happening. And I started to learn to just be okay with being single, even though it was a desire of mine. 
And in 2020, uh, mutual friends, who uh, so uh, this husband and wife, the wife has been a mentor of mine. The husband has been a mentor to my husband. And um, they thought it was time to introduce us. And so, which is probably the nicest way to meet somebody, <laughs> especially <laughs> yeah. in the hardest year to meet people. And we just started out talking on the phone and then we would meet for hikes because, you know, there wasn't too much to do. And we would, yeah, we just developed a friendship. But by the fall, we, um, you know, he asked my parents if he could officially court me, which is old fashioned term, mm -hmm. but I loved it. He won me over, he, you know, and he said he wanted to date me with the intention of marriage and we got married in 2021. So that's the biggest news. And I love it for so many reasons. But one of the things I, I say now is all the stuff I learned in recovery or in the classroom, I'm now getting firsthand application because there there is no other place than by living with somebody do you get to really work out your own <laughs> tendencies and just, you know, it's different than when I was a single person where I could do my best to interact with people in a healthier way. But now that I have somebody that's in my life all the time, I get a lot of opportunities for growth, which, you know, I love him and we both have come from a background of recovery. So we're willing to do what is necessary to work through any conflict that we might have. And um, yeah, I feel it makes me a better person. So I'm a fan of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan. That is that is beautiful. <laughs> Obviously, a huge congrats, Deanna. Thank That's you. Just incredible. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, virtually attend your wedding. Oh, you which did. Was That's right. Absolutely was beautiful. So thank you for the invite. <laughs> it was uh, yeah a a early COVID wedding, I guess in the in the scheme of things. So. Yeah, that was incredible. Just so happy for you. And uh, thank you. You know, again, I keep coming back to this power of Phi, and it's just, it is astonishing how your life has changed. I'm just, I'm just so happy. Like, it's, it's funny because in, in our first episode, we were talking about all of us having tears streaming down our faces, and it's, uh, it's hard not to get choked up. I mean, you've become a friend of mine over the last four plus years, and we haven't seen each other in person all that often since COVID. Uh, certainly looking forward to another another time where we can meet in person, but I'm yeah. just so happy for you. I've uh, you. never seen you as happy and you just look so healthy and wonderful. It's just, it's really amazing. Truly. Oh, thank you. I would have never, it was worth the wait. I would have never guessed this is where I'd be right now. And you know, it's not like everything is all roses and sunshine all the time. Like I said, we do have conflict, which I think, you know, and I'll have to share this. I just feel compelled to share this. So when we were in our premarital counseling I remember the pastor said to us, like, you can't bring two lives together without having sparks, you know, and it was the first time somebody said this to me. He said, you know, the goal is not to have a conflict free marriage, because if you do, maybe somebody's become apathetic. You're going to have disagreements. It's how you deal with those disagreements and conflict is what makes you either healthy or not. And I don't know why I always thought it, the goal was to be, you know, conflict free. And that's just impossible, right? I mean, it's just you bring two different people with two different lives and especially even older, we had been set in our ways. So that gave me freedom to realize, okay, we can expect to have disagreements. It's going to be how we handle it that sets us apart. Yeah, that's really profound. Yeah. That it's not about being conflict free because yeah, if that happens, it's either a facade or like you said, someone is apathetic. And I did want to also jump in and say, like you said, it's not unicorns and rainbows every yeah. day. I mean, that's not that's not the practical reality of life. It just isn't. And I've been really focusing in on this on the podcast the last couple of months, you know, because I, I think it's important that people understand that there is so much benefit to pursuing financial independence. And I think that is like hard stop, end of story. I don't think there's any other way to argue that other than pursuing financial independence is a massive net positive, massive, massive, massive. When you have to stress about personal finance or your money, that is the thing that supersedes just about everything other than, other than your health probably. And if you're stressed about money at all times, you don't have the time and space to think about all of these other existential issues or relationship issues because again, you're living in that fight or flight. But when you have your money set, and you do have some time and space, you're probably going to notice some of these other human existence type issues more often. And, and I want to make it entirely clear to everybody, there's nothing wrong with you 
that's perfectly normal. And, and I think we were talking about this, Deanna, before we had record of, I don't know anybody who isn't dealing with something on some level. And I know that's very vague, but everyone has their issues. And I think there are a lot of people who, who think because everything isn't unicorns and rainbows every single day that they're irreparably broken. And I think it's that irreparably word that I'd love to dial in on because I think you and I would both argue almost nobody is irreparably broken. And, and I think yeah. just having that understanding is really critical. Absolutely. And I hope my story is that testament to people like if you're still breathing, you're not too far gone. I mean, no matter how far down the road you are, there's still a chance for restoration, for redemption, for repair, 100%. And maybe I'll just segue into this, that my husband and I, when we got married, we knew we'd be called to do some kind of ministry together, just both with our past of dealing with brokenness and overcoming. So we started a ministry this year, and it's called Broken Vessels Made Whole. And it's just that. I think most people, I think all people have some level of brokenness, some more than others. And it's our goal to help people uncover what that is. And in our experience dealing with addictions, it's not about the addiction. It's really about the woundedness that's beneath the surface that resulted in the symptom of becoming addicted to something. So anyway, this ministry, there is this beautiful picture and it's a Japanese art form called Kintsuki or Kintsukuri. And it's where they take broken pottery or broken vessels and they repair it with silver, gold, or platinum joinery. And the whole concept is you're more beautiful for having been broken. And so I feel like that sums it up the story of my life. You know, I, I could have allowed everything that I went through to just destroy me, utterly destroy me, and I could stay in that woundedness. But instead, um, you know, and I'll say it again, by the grace of God, I've chosen to dig into my past woundedness and to learn to reconcile with it, to forgive people, to heal. And out of that, it's now become a story. You know, my life is now used to help other people that are trying to overcome whatever woundedness or addictions or anything like that. And then it becomes this beautiful cycle, right? Of coming out of this and healing and then helping another person coming out of it and so on. And um, it's very hopeful. Yeah. It is extraordinarily hopeful. That's what's so beautiful about your message and why we've seen throughout the years on Chooseify that stories are what people connect to. It's not, obviously, as we all know, it's not the nuts and bolts of money. It's not the Roth IRA conversion ladder. Nobody is getting lit up by that. It, it's a wonderful tool, obviously, and, and things like that. Like, oh, the triple tax benefit of the HSA. That's great. <laughs> but that's not what draws you in. It's the humanity that draws you in. Yeah. It's the overcoming. It's the seeing yourself in someone else's story. And that person was able to do this through a lot of adversity. And there are people from all different backgrounds and life stories who have overcome adversity in some way. And somebody out there, or many someones in, in this case, are going to relate to your story and say, wow, I can do that too. I can get out of this abusive relationship. I can I can recover from a significant addiction and I can see my personal finances and, and be in a position like you where you said, I felt like there was no way out and you can find a way out. That is just so, so beautiful. And, and speaking of beautiful, broken vessels made whole. I mean, what a, what a name. That's incredible. I, I, you know, I don't know exactly how a ministry works and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because I, I suspect there are people out here. If it's something, I'm not sure if it, you have to be located in your in your exact area, but if it's possible to take part in that online or virtually, I suspect there are people who are who would be interested in that. So I do want to get to that in one second. But I had never heard of this. So kintsugi mm -hmm. is yeah this Japanese art, and I, I'm looking at an NBC News article from it. It says whether you are going through a job loss or divorce, this practice of fixing broken things may help heal what's broken in you. And yeah, I'm looking literally here at pottery that's broken, that's visibly broken, but put back together. And it's isn't beautiful, that just, isn't it? It's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. I've never, never heard of that before, but I'm going to, I'm going to really look into this now. Yeah. Early on, and we didn't start the ministry until this year, but we early on prayed and fasted what it might look like. And my husband is the one that 
came up with broken vessels. He's like, I think it should be called broken vessels. And I looked at him and I said, made whole, right? That's the whole part of it. So it was kind of a joint effort. Yeah. And you were talking about, you know, fight or flight, which I think this, I've been doing a bit of research on fight or flight, um, which we can get to. I've been working on writing a book, but there is so much that can occur when a person is stuck in fight or flight. And then the first thing is, you know, this is a quote from a guy named Dr. Fred Luskin, who is responsible for the Stanford Forgiveness Project. And he wrote a book called Forgive for Good. And this is a quote from that book. He said, the body is so exquisitely designed to protect us from danger that it won't allow us to waste our precious resources on planning things out or thinking new ideas. So it's amazing that that's how our bodies were designed. But the problem is if somebody is stuck in that fight or flight, you know, if you're in a chronic stress situation, whether it's an abusive relationship, whether it's drowning in debt, which can go back to the financial, whatever that situation is that it keeps a person in chronic stress, your brain. So then there's this other doctor. His name is Dr. John Medina. He wrote a book called Brain Rolls, which is an incredibly simple, easy book to read and talks about how our brain works and how we can heal them. And his opinion is that being in chronic stress actually causes brain damage. So there's two things that shut down and they've discovered this when they've done some experiments. So one study showed that adults with high stress levels performed 50% worse on declarative memory. So things that you can declare and executive function, which is problem solving and self-control. So it's crazy, you know, when we, and you've talked about that um, Maslow's hierarchy, when you're stuck dealing with just surviving, right? You're not able to actually think about how do I get out of this or how do I, you know, for me, when I was drowning in debt, how did I even imagine what it would be like to invest? Like I didn't even have the capacity to try to learn what that looked like, right? Because I was just surviving. So anyway, I felt I wanted to share some of that research. Yeah, that's beautiful. I did not know the subject of your book. You told me you were writing a book. So this is in process right now? In process. Yeah. I started, I got about five chapters done over the summer and then um, I'm picking it back up now. So I'm just a little under halfway done. But yeah, it's just, it's a teaching book to teach others who want to overcome addictions or strongholds and or just deal with some woundedness of their past to become the person that they were created to be. And so kind of taking them through a journey, it is a faith-based book, but starting with, you know, kind of a surrender and then building up daily habits and then digging a little bit deeper into maybe past woundedness, any uh, hidden unforgiveness, any hidden resentments, and then moving forward from there, learning to forgive. And then it will continue to go on from there. And that's why I've been doing so much research on forgiveness. I just, I found in my personal experience, my husband's experience, and then the people that we, that we minister to, that seems to be a huge stumbling block is the inability to forgive other people and really digging in what does forgiveness look like. It doesn't mean excusing somebody of behavior. You know, we've met people that have had horrible cases of abuse. And, you know, understandably, they're having a hard time forgiving their perpetrator. And it's, we're not saying that what they did was okay. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that you have to reconcile with that person. But to quote this Dr. Fred Luskin, again, he says, when we blame somebody else for our suffering, when we believe that someone else is the cause of our pain, then we need something from that other person in order to feel better. And so, in reality, if it's somebody that was not safe to be around, you know, you're not going to want something from that person. And so forgiveness is really about the self, right? Learning to let go for the sake of your own healing. And it sometimes can be the hardest stumbling block to overcome. But in my opinion, it's so necessary to be able to move forward and to not live in the past, but to live, you know, in the future or in the present and create a new future. Yeah, that is, that's beautiful. And it's so easy to just let your mind take over with, with both. It, it's interesting about the, the living in the present, because that is yeah. the hardest place to live. I know. <laughs> because you think it about is. anxiety is to a large degree, and, and this is not a, not a clinical definition, but it's my own definition is thinking about a fictional future, and you're inflicting current pain on yourself, thinking about some fictional future that is only exists in your head. 
that's what anxiety is to a large degree, at least how I think about it. And then, yeah, ruminating on a past that, as you said, I mean, you, you cannot change the past clearly. And many of us get stuck in the past. And I think that's why that the concept of forgiveness, like you said, it doesn't mean reconciling. It doesn't mean saying that was okay what happened, but coming up with some level of being able to forgive mostly in your own brain and move on. And I think it's interesting, and I'm glad you quoted some of those books. I, I suspect there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is uh, yes. similar. I don't know if that that's in your book yeah. as well, but that book has been at or near the top of the nonfiction uh, charts for quite some time now. And I suspect, I actually have it on my bookshelf. I, I have not, that's in my queue, but I suspect there are similar things. And that's how a lot of this stress and trauma over years and decades manifest itself in our own bodies and why we it, it's this intersection of fight or flight and trauma and it's hard to get beyond yeah i have that book i actually quote it and i don't have it in front of me but i've quoted it in a few of the chapters that i wrote in the effects on our body which is what i started looking into when i realized you know there's a stanford forgiveness project and he also says you know when rehearsing a grudge subjects they found that the blood pressure, heart rate, and arterial wall pressure rose. And so if these symptoms occur for a long period of time, that's going to cause heart and blood vessel damage. Like there is physical negative effects of holding on to resentments or unforgiveness. And it can, so I talked about the worst case. I mean, there's, you know, extreme cases of a person being abused, but it can even happen in a little case, you know, like if you're hurt by somebody, but you keep reliving it and feeling like you want that person to be punished, that can also affect you, right? If you're just stuck ruminating on what happened. And that's where Dr. Fred Luskin, who wrote this book, Forgive for Good, talks about it's changing our story. So, you know, if you have a grievance story and you find yourself telling that grievance story, it's to really stop and take a breath and think about how do you want to retell, like you can't change the facts of the past, but how you can certainly shift your perspective on that past and what you went through and now use it to pivot and grow from. And, you know, you talk about that all the time. It's all about the story, right? That draws people in. So what kind of story do you want to tell other people? What kind of story is your life? And that's been a huge thing for me because when I was in my addiction, I was very much from the perspective of self-pity and a victim mindset. And I really had to work hard to get out of that. And occasionally I can slip back into that. Like, you know, I might be hurt in some other way and I could find myself slipping back into that, but I try to catch myself and I've given my husband permission to catch me and vice versa and to try to shift it from, okay, you know, do I want to forgive this person? And then how can I grow from here? How can I become a stronger person? Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm super excited for when you finish the book, obviously a book is a large undertaking. So I don't know precisely when that's going to happen, but we will definitely let the Choose Up Eye audience know. I guess one easy way for me would be to put it out in my newsletter. So for anybody listening who, well, A, you should just be subscribing to my newsletter. It's the Phi Weekly. I think it's a really great way to stay on top of what's going on in the Phi community and to hear the wins from your fellow Phi community members. So chooseify.com slash subscribe. And yeah, Deanna, I'll definitely put it in there when the book is published. So very excited about that. And so in there, you mentioned that you were writing a couple chapters over the summer, and then you took some time off. I, I think there's an intersection there with some of what's going on in your personal and financial life. So I, I'd be curious if we could just kind of like catch up to speed on, on where is Deanna today? Because I think when we talked to you four years ago, you said you had about a, I think it was a 14 year path to FI, maybe four or so years in, maybe maybe five years in, because if we're doing the math from the beginning of when you found FI, but the details aren't important. So yeah, let me know what is going on today. Yeah. So I feel like I want to start here at this point. When I met my husband, he had a little bit of debt. And I remember back when I had been blogging, when I first started getting on the path to financial independence, I would blog about this. And somebody posed a question to me. They said, well, are you willing to date somebody who has debt? Are you willing to date somebody who doesn't know about financial independence and all these things? And I think my response was, well, 
I think I'll be okay with those things as long as they're on a path to better themselves. So like, I'm not okay with somebody who's just fine staying stuck. And when I met my husband, he had done a lot of work on himself personally and spiritually and a lot of his brokenness, but he was just kind of starting the journey on his financial life. So he brought a little bit of debt to the marriage. To me, some of the worst kind of debt, he owed some back taxes to the IRS and then he had a car payment. So it wasn't in a huge amount, you know, and I talked to him about it. I was like, you got to pay off that IRS debt like ASAP. And so he really started plowing forward. And then when we got married, we moved into my one bedroom apartment and just paid it off really quickly. And, um, you know, got a different car, still have a car payment, but are in a much better position than his first car payment, which had a high interest. So just made some changes there and then started both ramping up his investment and buying investment. And then we got to a place where we started to pray about me leaving my job. Um, I had a great job for years and allowed me to get to meet a lot of my financial goals and just went through a season of high stress and he saw it firsthand. And that was really when we first started praying about doing something different. And I felt really led. I felt clarity that I, that it was time for me to leave and take a sabbatical. And he blessed me to do so. We looked at the budget and realized we could do it. We could live on his income and that he makes a good income. And so I had this transition out of my job. It had been a great job for me. So I didn't I felt compelled to give them a long runway and we negotiated about a five and a half month runway where I helped train more people and and they helped me transition into that new lifestyle by kind of weaning me off. I went from five days to four days a week and then after a month or so, I went down to three days a week. So I started to learn what it was like to have this free time, which was very helpful. And we were able to max out all my retirement accounts for that first six months of 2022, which taught us to learn to live on one income. So we started practicing before it actually became a reality. And yeah, I left my job in June of 2022 and, you know, have great respect for them. It was a great job for years. And then I took a sabbatical. I wasn't sure how long. So I started in the summer and started working on the book. And we started thinking about launching the ministry, which did launch in the fall. And then I took a part-time job that started in September and pretty quickly I realized it's not where I meant to be. I really, I was overwhelmed with tasks and I, I had to put the book on pause and my heart was kind of breaking for that. So we decided that the sabbatical needed to be longer and my position that I took part-time became a transitional position. I updated a lot of systems in this job and tried to bring some processes up to the 21st century. I trained somebody new and then have just transitioned out of that role. So now I'm back on sabbatical when I just turned 50. And <laughs> so, which is amazing that we can do that. I mean, and it's in no small part due to the money that I had saved being single. And then just that early part of our marriage, getting ourselves in that position of getting that debt out of the way and then building up our retirement accounts to the place where, okay, we can do, we, and we are still investing. We can do this. I mean, I'll also say in the process, my husband got a promotion. So that certainly helped. We're able to invest and I'm able to take a sabbatical. I'm not sure for how long, and I'm going to finish writing the book and then just continue to pour into the ministry. And yeah, so that that's where I'm at today. Wow. Yet again, Deanna, the the power of Phi that is uh, really quite amazing, and and yeah, I mean that's the beautiful thing is when you have this space financially, you can make decisions from a, a position of not only power, and that might be a, a slight, slightly inappropriate word in this case because there was no issue with your old job or this current job, right? I know you loved your old job. We've talked about that many times. So it's not an issue of like a, like an FU money or anything even remotely approaching that. It's just literally, this is where, as you're saying, what I feel called to do. And that for you was creating this book, which is going to have an impact on the world, creating this ministry, which is going to have an impact on many people. And that's where your season of life is now. And that's, that would have been obviously impossible six years ago. I mean, four years ago, three, yeah. right? Impossible. And that's, again, just the power of what we're doing here of having options. And as you said, okay, I took a part-time job and we could probably dive into the psychology of that. Maybe you, but it, it's almost not even worth it, but you quickly realize 
hey, this isn't where I should be right now. And it sounds like you helped that organization significantly. Like you said, you got some processes up to current day, et cetera, and you're helping them transition, which is great. So you added value, but that wasn't where you were getting the most value or you could provide the most value to the world. And I, I just love how in the moment you are and how in touch you are with your own thoughts and feelings and values. So, I mean, it's this is really, really important for everybody out there because this is the arc of a FI journey. It really is, right, Deanna? I mean, it, you were talking under six years since you found the very first day you found Choose a FI. And at the beginning, as you said, with Dave Ramsey, you felt very uncertain with money. And now you're at a position where you're maxing all of these retirement accounts. I assume your husband is maxing them. And you're in a position where you don't need to work and you can still pursue all your financial goals, but more importantly, pursue your life goals. Yeah. And it, it might be worth parking a little bit on the psychology of that part-time job because I realized I took the job out of fear. You know, I had never... I mean, since I was 16, I've always worked. And since I was 18, I've worked full-time, like even through college. I've, I mean, there's maybe been a few periods where it wasn't full-time, but I've worked my whole life. And I, I just, it was fearful to realize I'd not be contributing money. And so I took it and making a decision out of fear is not really the way to make a decision. And fortunately, I was able to you know recognize that and then get out of it. But I, as I've been transitioning out, I realized, I think I've identified a lot of who I am with my career and my ability to work. And I was talking with our pastor and I said, I've never not worked in my life. And I'm a little nervous about this. And he said, well, it doesn't sound like you're going to be not working. It just sounds like you're not bringing in an income for your work. And it, that helped me shift my perspective. And and I, who knows if my book will make any money. I it's not even, you know, it's just feel like it's in me and I need to get it out and whatever, you know, if it helps one person, I'll be happy. And if it helps more people, I'll be really happy. But it's a book that's inside of me that has to come out and I am working. I'm still working. It's just right now it's not producing income. And because of our intentional choices, we're able to do that, which, yeah, I mean, thank you, Brad and Jonathan for introducing me to this concept, what made it possible to even make a choice like this. Yeah. Well, Thank you for being such an active member of our community. Thank you for internalizing the message and most importantly, taking action to I mean, radically, radically transform your life in every possible way. So Deanna, as I said, my friend, it's just so good to know you. It's so good to see how your life has changed in such wonderful ways. And I just, uh, I'm so thankful you came back on the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. I love seeing your face, even if it's virtually <laughs> and yeah. It just feels like no time has passed. Yes, <laughs> That's how good friends are, right? Indeed, indeed. And so uh, a lot of the things you have are works in process. So we don't have anywhere to, to send people right now, but hopefully you will come back on the show. And like I said, to anybody out there, I will definitely mention this in the Fi Weekly. So chooseavi.com slash subscribe. I think that's the best we can do for people getting in touch with you right now. Yeah. I mean, if you want me to share, I have a, we bought a domain, but the website is, I guess, under construction. We haven't, and I don't know if it'll be up and ready by the time this airs, but it will be at some point. So it's called Broken Vessels Made Whole dot life. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to launch that soon. Okay. Well, that is beautiful. So Broken Vessels Made Whole dot life. And yeah, when this goes out, it probably will go to a, a park page or this site doesn't exist, but if Deanna's message speaks to you, then I know you'll follow up as, as I always do. Like put it in a, a task manager. I use Todoist, T-O-D-O-I-S-T, and you can put it for a couple months from now. Check back at this website. And I think that's just a neat little life hack in general. So yeah, we cannot promise that the site will be live when you're hearing this, but if this means something to you, check back. I think that's... Uh, the best way and and yeah put a little recurring task in so anyway my uh, my little sidebar i can't shut it off deanna <laughs> with these little light dogs <laughs> oh man well again thank you so much for coming on and uh thank you to the audience for being here